Call the meeting of the San Juan Unified Board of Education to order. There are three closed session items on tonight's agenda, student expulsion in one case and student enrollment in one case, education code section 48918F, discussion with negotiator Paul Oropalo, Assistant Superintendent, Human Resources, regarding unrepresented employee general counsel, government code section 54957.6. One personnel matter, government code section 54957, superintendent's evaluation. We do not have any speaker cards on the closed session agenda items. We will now move into closed session and will return to open session at 8.30 p.m. I call the meeting of the San Juan Unified Board of Education back to order. The meeting is being audio and video recorded and the recording may capture sounds and images of those attending this meeting. The recording will be posted on the district's website. Board meetings are being held in person in the boardroom at the district office and the community is welcome to attend. The meeting may also be viewed on the district's YouTube channel where it's being live streamed. Please stand for the presentation of colors by the Dale Campbell High School Air Force Junior ROTC. Board Arch. Colors, colors turn, arch. Good evening. Oh, that's right. Good evening and welcome. I'm Zima Creason, board president. To my left is Ms. Pam Costa, board vice president. To her left is Mr. Saul Hernandez, board clerk. And to his left, Mr. Ben Avey, Ms. Paula Viesquez, and Ms. Tanya Krevchek, board members. To my right is Superintendent Bastinelli. And to her right is board administrative assistant, Stephanie Cunningham. Individuals who are attending the meeting in person and would like to offer public comment, we ask that you complete a speaker request card available at the staff table, and you will be called on at the appropriate time during the agenda. Please note that board bylaw 9323 limits visitor comments to two minutes per speaker with no more than 30 minutes per single topic. Time will be extended for any speaker who uses an interpreter. Please note that public comments, including your name, become of the public record. We are now at item D, approval of the minutes. Are there any corrections to the minutes? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve the minutes for May 9th? Moved. moved by Ms. Viesquez. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Krevchek. All those in favor say aye. 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 That was unanimous. We are now at item E1, recognitions. Tonight we have two recognitions. Let's begin with Mira Loma High School National Science Bowl. Ms. Schnell. Good evening, President Creason, 
Members of the board, Superintendent Bassanelli and Ms. Cunningham. Tonight, I'm here to recognize and celebrate Mira Loma's Science Bowl team. Mira Loma teams placed first, second, and third at the Sacramento Regional Science Bowl. The first place team then moved on to compete at the U.S. Department of Energy's National Science Bowl competition, which was held from April 27th through May 1st in Washington, D.C. The Mira Loma team placed fifth, um, placed fifth in the national competition. And Mira Loma High School has previously won the National Science Bowl competition five times, which is more than any other high school in the United States. In addition, Mira Loma has competed in the national competition 27 times in the, um, has competed 27 times, which is also more than any other school in the United States. The Mira Loma High School team is coached by James Hill, who has taken the team 24 times to the National Science Bowl. And this is more than any other coach in the history of the U.S. Department of Education National Science Bowl. Please help me honor the following team champions of Mira Loma Science Bowl. I'm gonna invite coach James Hill to the podium to introduce his team at this time. Mm -hmm. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, we're happy to and proud to represent the San Juan School District and Mariloma High School. Uh, this is a hardworking team, and so I'd like to present them to you now. Uh, first, we have Harish Ram Kumar. Sahom yeah. Chakraborty. Sartok Agrawal. Aditya Sivakumar, and the team captain, Napoon Dower. And Napoon would like to say a few words if you have time. Please. All right, thank you. Um, hello, Board of Education. I'm Napoon Dower, captain of the Mir Loma Science Bowl team and an AT member for the past four years. First off, I'd like to thank the board for this opportunity to be here and speak. I would also like to thank Mr. Hill for creating a collaborative and educational environment with this competition. The Science Bowl community has shaped me to be a passionate learner, but also to be supportive of my peers. Alumni from decades ago have supported us in achieving our dreams, both in individual achievements and as a team. As upperclassmen, we give lessons to the next generation of players to train them and hope they, did, they, do, they do better than we did. Every student on the Science Bowl team works incredibly hard to be in the position they are in. Thanks to everyone's efforts, we were able to achieve this amazing accomplishment. Thank you, Mr. Hill, for helping and guiding us through this remarkable experience. Thank you. And at this time, we're here to answer any questions you may have. So exciting questions, comments from the board, Ms. Viesquez. Testing, okay, great. Congratulations to the team and to Mr. Hills. I think some of my colleagues know, but we are joined by new colleagues. Um, Mr. Hills is actually my science teacher at Mariloma. And to this day, I live in fear that he may still have some of my chemistry tests somewhere <laughs> tucked in his closet, um, but hopefully that's not the case. Uh, I also want you to know that I still know what oil rig stands for, though I've yet to ever use it to describe the relationship of electrons. Um, congratulations, um, both for this, but for your many, many years of coaching fantastic students. Congratulations to the students for keeping up with Mr. Hill and his rigorous program. Um, we continue to be very proud of you all, and I hope this is not a one of continued successes for you, Mr. Hill, and for the team. Congratulations. Ms. Krepchen. I just want to congratulate you all. I'm so impressed. All of the accolades, all of the awards, the amount of times that you've gone to nationals, the amount of teams you've taken, it's super impressive. And I was actually further impressed when you spoke about alumni still being involved and upperclassmen mentoring the younger ones. So it seems like you've really built 
um, your own kind of community and affinity group. And that's really special to have that connection in school and beyond, because I think the relationships that you've formed are going to follow for many years and maybe your entire lifetime. So congratulations, Mr. Hill, you've done something truly remarkable. Any other comments, questions from the board, Mr. Hernandez? I just want to congratulate you, Mr. Hill, as well as your team. You guys, uh, you you actually make us look good, and we appreciate that very, very much. When we go throughout representing this district throughout the state and even the country, some things are automatic, and one of those is the Maryland, Mariloma Science Bowl team. And so we want you to know that, and again, you make us look good. So thank you very, very much. Ms. Costa. I'd like to offer my congratulations to the team and my sincere thanks to Mr. Hill, who has continued year after year to give heart and soul to this, and we really appreciate it. And I am passing on from a former board member, Lucinda Luchin, her congratulations. She would have been here tonight, but she is out of country, and she wanted you to know, great job, Miraloma, again, and thank you, Mr. Hill. You have a lot to be proud of, students. That's a big deal. Um, I can't congratulate you enough, but what a wonderful way to end this school year. Um, the Kings may have lost their championship, but you're making me feel a whole lot better that we won something. And Mr. Hill, just, I mean, you're setting records. That's just amazing that your leadership has continually uh, brought this achievement to our district and to your students. And we are so lucky to have you. So congratulations. And let's give them one more round of applause. Love it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Schnepp. Our next recognition is for retiring Superintendent Kent Kern. Superintendent Bassanelli. Hi, yes, good evening. We are um, presenting a resolution honoring Superintendent Kent Kern um, as his last day is June 30th. Superintendent Kern has served the school district for more than three decades with the past nine years as superintendent. He leads with service, humility, and shared leadership. And we are immensely grateful for his service to the San Juan Unified community. So I'd like to invite Superintendent Kent Kern forward, please. <laughs> well, and I, I do want to publicly thank and acknowledge you um, allowing us to provide you with this opportunity. For those of you that do know Superintendent Kern, um, he likes to share the light, not be in the light. And so I know that this is really um, not how he rolls, but I do appreciate him allowing us to appreciate him um, in this moment for his service. So we have um, several folks here to present resolutions. So just hang tight and enjoy it. <laughs> uh, no, no, you should probably stand. <laughs> this is the only time I get to tell him what to do. <laughs> okay. So um, I would like to invite Erlinda Bowman, District Representative from Senator Roger Nilo's office forward. <laughs> I present the certificate on behalf of Senator Nilo. Thank you for your service. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'd like to invite Assemblyman Josh Hoover forward. I have not uh, been in this boardroom before, but it is kind of nice being back. It's yeah. setting again. I kind of miss it, I'll be honest. But uh, just thank you so much for your commitment to our community. I know you've been spent nine years as superintendent, but um, you know I think you should have two or three more years on that for serving through the pandemic. Uh, so um, just uh, I, I can't even imagine what it was like from a superintendent navigating the district through that time period. Um, just extremely grateful for your service. Thanks for having me here, Don. Thank Appreciate you for all it. you do too. Right. Thank you. 
Next, I'd like to invite Erica Costa, from uh, District Director from Assemblyman Kevin McCarty's office. Um, on behalf of Assemblymember McCarty, thank you for your commitment to public service, education, and the students of San Juan. Congratulations thank on you your so retirement. Much. Appreciate it. Thank you. And Supervisor Richard Desmond's office when, was unable to attend, but they have also provided a resolution. Um, I'd like to invite Barry Roth, president for the San Juan Teachers Association, forward. Kent, congratulations. Um, on behalf of SJTA, we just we want to thank you for your leadership. And I hope you know we value you as a person, your character, the way you led. You know, when you think about it, when you came into the position, it was a time of some instability. Collaboration existed at the table, but not much beyond. But you were focused and determined to increase that, and you worked together with us. So we moved from collaboration to partnership, and we very much value that. And our district is better because of you. Also, that was so important to you is voice and that we have a, a multiple perspectives in all the work as we approach our work that was essential to you and to all of us. And again, we've moved forward as a district because of that, you know, um, when also under your leadership. Equity department student support center were created and through those things. Giving students voice showing love to students, the respect to students, providing them with the supports they deserve has just made this an incredible district. So we will miss you. Congratulations. Some of us are a little envious that you're retiring, <laughs> um, but your legacy will continue to lead forward. Thanks, man. And we just have about 30 more minutes for this item. So hang <laughs> tight. No? Okay. Um, what I do want to um, do next is I want to read the resolution. I was attempting to summarize it, but I decided to go ahead and read it because it does it does um, <laughs> capture your 35 years with us. So this, I'd like to read resolution A428, honoring Kent Kern. Whereas Kent Kern has led a distinguished career as an educator and leader for nearly 35 years. And whereas Kent is a product of the district having attended San Juan Unified Elementary, Middle and High Schools. And whereas Kent became a teacher in the district upon graduating from CSU Sacramento and has dedicated his professional career to its students, families and educators. And whereas Kent has risen to the opportunities and challenges of the day by having served the district and its constituents, not only as a teacher practitioner, but also as an athletic coach, vice principal, principal, directors of schools and programs, director of safe schools, senior director of facilities and planning, assistant superintendent of operations and school support before ultimately accepting the position of superintendent in 2014. And whereas Kent has been instrumental in securing resources needed for transformational change in San Juan Unified as a driving force between behind two facility bond measures, providing more than $1 billion in needed funds to repair, upgrade, and replace schools throughout the district. And whereas Kent has provided leadership that resulted in sound fiscal management of public funds and positive certified um, certifications for the district budget for nearly a decade, and whereas Kent has strengthened and further developed San Juan Unified's collaborative culture with employee groups resulting in innovative and transformative practices such as the system of professional growth to support certificated practitioners development. And whereas Kent has proven to be an effective manager of crisis and change as he led the district through the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and its aftermath. And whereas Kent has been a champion for equity through increased student voice and decision making, creation of superintendent student advisory council, investments in equity based efforts to open access and participation to traditionally underrepresented student, family, and staff groups, and his personal efforts to form connections and relationships. Whereas Kent has invested in developing future generations of leaders to help guide the district, its schools, and community. And whereas Kent will retire from service in the district on June 30th, 2023. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the San Juan Unified School District Board of Education that on behalf of a grateful community and organization, we hereby express sincere appreciation to Superintendent Kent Kern for his services to the district and extend our heartfelt best wishes for him for good health and happiness in his retirement.
Well, let me just say, I, Melissa was right. I don't like this stuff, but um, <laughs> I, I want to say thank you. And really what I want to say is to the four board members up there who I had the experience to work with really for the last number of years, Saul and Pam, you guys hired me coming out of a really, really tough time. I was glad to hear you mentioned Lucinda and Greg and Dr. Masaoka, um, Dr. McKibben. I've got to work with some really dedicated people throughout my years. And really it's the work that we did over those years. You know, I'm so proud to say that every one of you, when we were going through whatever conversations, you know, those board meetings we had at El Camino when we were looking at um, the, the curriculum issues, you were also thoughtful and it's hard being a board member. And Josh probably knows this as well. I, I say at times being a board member is like being in a boxing ring with duct tape on your mouth and your hands tied behind your back. You get to get punched. People can say whatever they want. You can't say anything back. So you guys have been shown so much just dignity in the time that I've been working with you. I'm proud to say I really consider each and every one of you friends as well, having worked through this <clears throat> cabinet. Um, just so blessed to work with some amazing people. It's it's everybody that works together that really makes the successes that we have. Seeing like we have so many programs like like what's going on at Mariloma throughout our district that we just, you know, people don't necessarily know about, but there's so many successes. And then to have the partnerships with labor is huge because I often said, if you're not working together, you're fighting. And we have a real good example of that very close by of what the challenges that it creates that we don't want to fall into. So we want to continue to work and learn from each other. Um, that's our classified group. That's our administrators. That's our teachers. That's all of our employees, our teamsters. Everybody makes us successful and has really been a huge part of, of I think, my career and, and what I've enjoyed so much. Um, so just on behalf of myself, just thank you. Thank you for allowing me to, to serve alongside you for a long time. And I'm, I'm super excited that the district's in great hands. I get to go off to another state and ignore these meetings and what's going on. <laughs> I'm already practicing that. I'll tell you that when I'm there um, because I'm confident. I'm confident that the new board members, along with the, the elected official that will be here, will continue to make decisions that are in the best interest of kids. So, so thank you. Questions, comments from the board. Ms. Viesquez. Superintendent Bassanelli, I'm glad you read it, because if not, I fully intended to make sure that the full resolution was read because it's hard to otherwise capture your full contributions to this district. And while I had the pleasure of um, serving alongside as board president with you during two of the most tumultuous years, that really just was a sliver of your full service to this district. Um, now, that being said, I am going to focus just a little bit in on the chaos, which was uh, some people might forget or maybe don't forget that pre-COVID, pre the toughest decision we ever thought we'd have to make in terms of whether or not to resume classes in person, um, that season immediately pr prior, right when I was taking over as board president, we were facing fires and because there was actually smoke conditions that um, made us evaluate the safety of our students. And that was actually a really, really tough decision and what I thought would be the only time we would ever have to make the decision <laughs> to make a call. And then of course, that turned out to not be the case. Um, complete chaos succeeded those events. Um, yes, of course, there was COVID and um, walking through that with you. I'm so glad that um, I had you as a partner and that you had the strength to lead such a fantastic team of folks because to this day, I'm confident that we made the best decisions for our students and for our community. Um, and then heading from COVID into um, the big buckets of international affairs problems falling into our laps very unexpectedly. At every turn, you had the well-being of our students first and foremost, and there was no task that was too big, too small, or too crazy. Um, to take on together. So uh, thank you for your leadership, but more importantly, thank you for along the way becoming a friend. Mr. Hernandez. Mr. Kurt, I would just like to thank you for your service to our district. Uh, the accolades have already been mentioned, so I will just go to 
what I think is your greatest characteristic as a person is that you're an honest man and everybody knows that. And uh, I just want you to know what a great uh, job as a, as a leader you have done, but more so as Paula mentioned that what a great friend that I have made. I remember once uh, there was a public request made on our cell phones. And so we had a period of time that we had to report our text messages superintendent. I remember calling our attorney and I said, you sure you want to see my texts to the superintendent? She said, we saw you had a, you got to send them. I said, okay. So the, I say this because this is kind of relationship I had with Mr. Kern. So my first text was a big picture of me in Idaho catching a fish. <laughs> and the picture back to me was, this is my sunset of my new house, Saul, you know, and that's all there was. So I don't know what juicy information they got, but from us, it was pure friendship. <clears throat> and I cherish that very much. Thank you, Mr. Kern. Pasta. I just want to thank you and say congratulations. And to say the thing that I cherish most is the way you treat people, your relationships and communications with individuals, whether it's students, employees, community members, parents, um, and board members is always one of caring and concern and also one of making sure, especially with the board, that we were informed right away. And that meant sometimes that you were calling each of us individually because it was so important that you make connection with us. And I kept thinking every time I got one of those calls, he has four more of these to do after me. Um, and I appreciated that so much to know that there was always a connection that if something was going to appear in the B or something was going to appear on the news, you had notified us first and you had discussed it with us. And I know when I watched you with your kids, with your student groups, they felt so heard. And what better gift can you give to anybody but to feel heard? I believe that people are put into our lives for a reason and I think you were put into the San Juan district as our superintendent for a very important reason to heal and bring the district back together. And I thank you for accomplishing that and for being an outstanding superintendent. Thank you very much. I'm gonna keep my remarks brief because I'm expected to facilitate a meeting for several hours and I don't wanna cry. Um, superintendent Kern, just know you did a good job. You did a really good job. So at the end of the day, when you're reflecting on your time, you did great. Um, I cannot speak to how much I've learned from you. When I came into this position in 2018, you were so kind. I mean, folks, I probably look tall behind here, but I'm a very short individual <laughs> and Kent's not. Um, and you know, this towering dude in this scary new position, I'm kind of, you know, maybe not the traditional board member or elected official, but I always felt welcomed and that I had a place and you helped me do a great job and learn my role. And you allowed me to be real and be myself 100% of the time. Being around you um, for myself and I've seen you and how you um, work with students and other team members, you allow us to bring our lived experience to the table and you celebrate it and you honor it and you help us plug in and take our hand and put us in situations where sometimes we may not be invited. I am so happy that you're my friend. My husband's upset that you have not booked a final um, a date night with him. So nurture your bromances and expect a tent, uh, text. And I just want to end with, I really, I appreciate you so much. And I wish you nothing but the absolute best in your future chapters. This is an action item, by the way. <laughs> so moved. Moved by Ms. Costa is their second. Seconded by Ms. Viesquez. Just to make it clear, this is a motion to adopt resolution number A428, recognizing recognizing retiring Superintendent Kent Kern. All those in favor say aye. 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 That was unanimous. Second one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. 
Take a breath. I think everyone can use just a breath for a second, right? Okay. We do not have any reports from staff, board appointed, district committees, employee organizations, or other district committees. We are at item E6, closed session expulsion actions. Mr. Hernandez. <clears throat> The vote, I'm sorry, the vote, the board voted unanimously to accept the written one stipulated expulsion in the case number M57 and to accept a hearing panel's recommendation on one enrollment in the case of 0S45. Zero, zero Thank you. Is that OS? I'm sorry. I... Is that OS or OS or OS? I'm sorry, I moved on to. Let me repeat that. Another in case number OS45. OS. OS. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez. We are at item. I apologize. I went back to help Mr. Hernandez. I lost my spot. I apologize. Yeah. We are at item F, visitor comments. We do have speaker cards for general visitor comment. Comments are limited to two minutes. The clock on the screen counts down the time. Under the Ralph M. Brown Act, the board is not allowed to comment on items that are not on the agenda, so we are not ignoring your comments. We just can't respond to individual comments. The superintendent can refer items to staff who can follow up with you. Ms. Rye, please facilitate public comment. Of course, we have one visitor comment, Taylor Vang. When you're ready. Good evening, superintendent and members of the board. Before I begin my public comment, I first wanna thank you for your service to our schools and our community. My name is Taylor Vang. I'm a parent of a seventh grade student at Winston Churchill Middle School. My husband's a truck driver on the road working, so he couldn't be here with us tonight. Our daughter had asked us to advocate for her and her classmate. This year, she was in row in Sonia Takiniko uh, choir musical class where she experienced retaliation, racism, bias, and unequal opportunities performed. Uh, by Mrs. Takaniko. Winston Churchill Middle School is showcasing their musical, The Little Mermaid, this week, the same week the new live movie, The Little Mermaid, is released. There has been so much racial backlash on, black, on a black actress receiving the leading role. There's an estimation of 20 students in Miss Takaniko class. However, the role Ariel was given to the only one student who depicted the same feature as a cartoon, Ariel, red head and light skin. Other roles were hand selected and given to judges who processed the audition with Ms. Takaniko. We emailed Ms. Takaniko back in March requesting to meet. The principal had asked us to accommodate to her emotions and wait. After four weeks, instead of meeting with us, Ms. Takaniko retaliated, hurting our daughter academically, uh, giving her an F on her progress grade. When we asked about the F, Ms. Takaniko did not have an explanation. When we asked for transparency and the rubric audition Ms. Takiniko shared with us, she has shredded the paper trails and stated her system she used was still fair. Accountability is incredibly important as it ensures teachers to recognize areas they can work on. Our goal was to ensure that in their curriculum there was equity and environment that allows students and equal opportunities, not based on the color of their hair, skin, or teacher's bias. Mrs. Takaniko is a representation and culture happening at San Juan Unified School District. We request that our formal uniform complaint is taken seriously and that it's addressed by the end of the school year 2023. I thank you all again. Thank you. And that was our only public comment. Thank you for your comment. We are at item G, consent calendar. Do, board, do any board members wish to remove any items from the consent calendar? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve items G1 through G11? So moved. Moved by Mr. Avey. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Hernandez. All those in favor say aye. 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 That was unanimous. We are at item I1, Expanded Learning Opportunities Program Plan. Dr. Kelvin.
Good evening, President Creason, members of the board, Superintendent Bassanelli, and Ms. Cunningham. The Expanded Learning Opportunities Program, or ELOP, provides funding for before, after, summer, or intercession learning programs that focus on developing the academic, social, emotional, physical needs and interests of students for grades transitional kindergarten through six. This evening's update will cover the background and program requirements of, the, of ELOP, a review of our current plan, program data, and next steps. We'll begin with Director of Student Support Services, Dominic Cavello, who will be followed by Manager of Expanded Learning and Prevention Programs, Debbie Middleton. Thank you, Dr. Calvin, and good evening, President Creason, members of the board, Superintendent Bassanelli and Ms. Cunningham. We are excited tonight to uh, update the board on district progress in implementing our plan for the new Expanded Learning Opportunities Program, commonly referred to as ELOP. Recently, uh, in recent weeks, the board has received updates on district ELO grant funding, <clears throat> which was tied to the pandemic to provide additional supports to students during the school day. As a reminder to the board and to hopefully avoid any confusion tonight, even though they are very similar in name, ELO P is not the same as ELO. So with that in mind, during the 2021-22 uh, school year, the California Department of Education announced new ongoing funding for districts to provide structured expanded learning programs outside of traditional school hours. Expanded learning programs are those held before and after school to include uh, such activities as enrichment, tutoring, social emotional learning, homework assistance, and more. The largest amount of statewide funding uh, in ELOP has been set aside for those districts with the highest percentage of students on free or reduced lunch with a minimum threshold of 75% or more unduplicated. The remaining funds are then distributed by a formula to districts below the 75% mark based on student enrollment and free and reduced lunch. San Juan Unified's current allocation based on our 21-22 unduplicated percentage resulted in approximately $19 million. This ELOP allocation is dynamic and based on San Juan's recent increase in free and reduced lunch percentage, it is expected this funding will slightly increase in the next school year. In order to utilize this funding, there are several key components and requirements that must be adhered to. Most notably, while expanded learning programs are open to any student, we must first prioritize access to programs for our foster youth, McKinney-Vento, low-income, and English learners in grades TK through 6. The expanded learning components of the program must also be minimally equivalent to those requirements in the state's after-school education and safety grant program, which in San Juan has traditionally been tied to our Bridges after-school grants. ELOP programs must also offer a minimum nine hour continuous school day to the students attending. So for example, if a school start and end time total six and a half hours, the expanded learning program must offer a minimum of at least two and a half additional hours to total nine plus hours. And finally, eligible students must also be offered an additional 30 days of expanded learning outside of the traditional school calendar, such as in summer school. The 2022-23 ELOP plan, which was presented to the board last May, included several goal areas. While this work is ongoing, the next few slides will highlight our progress towards those objectives. Our first goal for the plan was to align and expand staffing and our bridges after school programs. To date, 36 total positions have been reclassified under new expanded learning titles. In addition, positions were created and expanded to build capacity in programs to maximize student seats, including the new hiring of 38 expanded learning program assistants, three expanded learning program specialists, and six expanded learning site facilitators. A second objective was to initiate an expansion of programs and seats available at each site. During this school year, eight new sites were added to offer expanded learning programs, which included Arlington Heights, Cowan, Oakview, Schweitzer, Sierra Oaks, Trajan, Woodside, and Arcade. At this time, all district high-density and mid-density elementary and K-8 schools serving the vast majority of our eligible foster youth, McKinney-Vento, 
uh, low income and EL student populations now have a Bridges or a Bridges affiliated program on campus. And in total, over 4,200 students have been provided expanded learning program opportunities in district programs or site clubs at 48 school sites. <clears throat> Another major goal area was to identify and create seamless participation in other district programs offering before and or after school options by increasing our collaboration. This included a major step forward in working closely with our Discovery Club childcare programs, where over 125 unduplicated students grades TK through six have been identified to waive their program fees using ELOP funding. This will now allow for our students who are most in need the opportunity to enroll in after school programs at all elementary and K-8 schools across the district free of charge. In addition, we have worked closely with our leaders in visual and performing arts, physical education, technology, and mathematics through our PLI department to fully fund before and after school clubs at individual school sites. VAPA and PE student clubs are now operating at 37 sites with over 985 students participating. And new math hoops programs were created at six sites with 115 students enrolled after school. New clubs such as Lego and eSports are also currently being planned with the initial purchasing of materials and supplies supported by ELOP dollars. And we have also coordinated the shared funding for a facilitator position in the FACE department to support field trips for students outside of traditional school hours. Lastly, we have successfully launched new ELOP community partnerships with outside organizations. <clears throat> a very excited new partnership with the California Teaching Fellows Foundation has allowed expanded learning to increase capacity by hiring an additional 78 part-time staff members, primarily from local junior colleges and universities. These part-time staff are college students interested in pursuing future careers in education, and their work in our expanded learning programs provide for a potential pipeline to their future careers in San Juan Unified. CTFF also provides ongoing training and professional development to these staff, along with a dedicated coordinator to help us continue to build capacity. We have also piloted a partnership with YMCA to help provide expanded learning in the morning at three school sites who recently switched their bell schedules from the earliest start times to the latest. Cowan, DPM, and Oakview have all piloted before school programs to assist families with these challenges. And we are also excited for the upcoming summer where 250 slots have been reserved with ELOP funding for three one week sessions at the Sacramento Aerospace Museum Camp, which will begin in June as well as creating a partnership for next school year uh, to support our district's work with STORM, who will be providing student mentorship with our equity department at seven sites. And at this time, uh, Debbie Middleton, Manager Expanded Learning Programs, will be coming up to share an update on key measurements and data collected so far. Good evening. I'm happy to be here with Director Dominic Cavello to provide this update on the district's expanded learning opportunities programs. When looking to measure program effectiveness, we focused on two key components of importance, student attendance and engagement. The first slide shows, this first slide, slide shows the results for a sample of school sites when comparing 2021-22 average school day attendance for Bridges participants enrolled in the program 30 days or more to average school day attendance for students at the same school that did not participate in the program. As you can see from the examples on this slide and on the report in your packet, the data consistently shows higher average school day attendance for students who attended Bridges when compared to their peers who did not attend the program. On average, students enrolled in Bridges for 30 or more days attended 13 more school days than students who were not enrolled and all schools showed a positive attendance correlation to enrollment in Bridges. Research shows that attendance is an important factor in student outcomes. Every additional day a student is in school matters. The full school report is available to review in attachment B. Stakeholder voice is very important to the program and used to inform the continuous quality improvement process for each site. In addition to ongoing opportunities for student voice, such as class check-ins, voting on activities, and suggestion boxes and boards, 
The Bridges After School Program works with the district's assessment, evaluation, and planning department to conduct an annual perception survey of participating fourth through 12th grade students, parents and guardians, and school and program staff. This slide provides a sample of data from the 2021-22 school year. As you can see here, over 70% of students reported the program helped them attend school more often, believe they can succeed, feel safer at school, and get better grades. When looking at parent responses, 95% or more of parents agreed or strongly agreed that their students' participation in the program contributed to increased self-esteem, improved school day attendance, improved interest in schoolwork, and that the program provided their students a positive interaction and a safe and enriching environment. Additionally, over 80% of staff completing the survey reported the program helped with student school connectedness, improved staff student relationships, improved students interest in schoolwork, and offered a positive interaction in a safe and enriching environment. Program staff continue to look at ways to incorporate the voice of those we serve to ensure the best experience possible for students and families. Now, Mr. Cavella will share the next steps planned for the program. Hey, thank you, Debbie. Based on our ELOP plan, our work is far from done. We are continuously looking to provide expanded learning opportunities to more students in new and creative ways. Our main focus will continue to be to build back staffing levels and increase capacity in all district ELOP programs. In order to evaluate initial demand at sites, we have sent an interest form to over 12,000 eligible families with students in grades TK through five for potential enrollment in Bridges or Discovery Club. Expanded learning summer programming has been increased to 35 sites district-wide, including our Bridges and Discovery Club programs. And in addition, we're also looking forward to new contracts with community partnerships for after-school offerings, such as Project Says, who will be working with students at six pilot sites next year to provide after-school enrichment activities focusing on student voice. We have also just launched our first Early Start Expanded Hours Bridges program to serve half-day AM TK and kinder students at Skycrest, and we will continue to expand those opportunities as new school sites and staffing and space become available. And finally, work will continue around ensuring our programs and clubs meet all state requirements, as the first audit guide for this program is not yet available, but is expected to be available by July 1st. And with that in closing, we wanna thank the board tonight for your interest in expanded learning programs. We are open to any comments or questions you may have for us. Thank you, team and Mr. Cavello. Any questions, comments from the board? Mr. Hernandez. Oh, Mr. Avey. No, go ahead. Oh, I just had a rather simple question and it might not be for you. What's the difference between Bridges, Discovery Club, and YMCA? Is it is it Coke and Pepsi, or are they different models of, of care? A little bit of Coke and Pepsi. Okay. Um, but um, so, you know, essentially, just to kind of put it in the context of ELO, of the Expanded Learning Opportunities Program, the intent there is to create a comprehensive sort of global um, use of these funds across the district to serve the students who are most in need. Um, our Discovery Club uh, child care programs, which I believe it has an upcoming, maybe in the future, update uh, for the board, is really based on traditional child care programming. Mm -hmm. um, certificated teachers, kind of a, um, definitely a um, kind of meeting the child care requirements. Um, whereas our Bridges After School program um, meets the after school education grant requirements by the state. So we're not required to meet the same level of some of the requirements of a child care program. But in that context, we're, we're attempting to serve the, the same students who are eligible. YMCA is then an offshoot of ELOP where we're, you know, the, the intent once again of the dollars is the acknowledgement that districts can't do everything with our own staff and to really try to be creative in finding community partners to help us provide those supports before and after school. And YMCA amongst others, um, shared that interest with us. And that's why they are sort of piloting with us um, for those before and after school programs at sites, if that makes sense. Thank you. Yep. Other comments, questions from the board? Ms. Krefchek. 
A follow-up question to that. I noticed um, in my site visits that most schools have either Bridges or Discovery Club, and some schools have both. And I'm wondering how the ones who have both, how those decisions are made, and if that's available to all schools, or if, and where that decision is made. Is it at the school level or um, higher in the district? Um, so historically, with Bridges After School, um, the funding has been grant-based. And that grant requires services or a percentage of um, free and reduced lunch at the school. And that's the target audience for the programs. And so there's kind of two populations, um, you know, because I can't think of another way to explain it, of students that were able to be served mm -hmm. um, beyond the capacity of what the grant was able to serve. And so for some sites, Discovery Club was able to bring in students that were full fee where bridges would come in and be able to serve students who maybe couldn't afford the bridges program or were beyond the capacity, I mean, of the Discovery Club program or beyond the capacity of the Discovery Club, Club program to serve. So if the school site met that um, criteria, then they potentially could have both. Correct. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Any other questions, comments? Ms. Costa. Having listened to school board members from all over the state, everyone is experiencing the same need for after school care for all ages, for young kids and for kids in clubs who are older and for summer programs. And when I looked at this, I was just so excited. I was able to share it actually with other board members around the state and say, this is what we have going in San Juan. So if you get calls, I'm the one that's responsible for it, but I really do think this is just amazing. And my fellow board members from around the state thought it was amazing too. So thank you for the work. Thank you. Any other questions, comments from the board? We do have a public comment card. Uh, Ms. Wright, can you please facilitate public comment? Of course, we have Brandy Ayun. You can go ahead and go up to the podium. Hello, how's everyone doing? Um, my concern with this was with the, um, so I, my, I brought my, I moved up here from Louisville, Kentucky. So I had two daughters at the time and one attended San Juan High School, one attended Will Rogers, and then moved to Sylvan and Mesa Verde. And I moved them out of San Juan School District because honestly coming from here, it's been a struggle to find an after school program, help from them. And I'm just gonna be very blunt that for African-Americans, it's not easy at all for San Juan. Most of the parents told me, pull your child out of it, San Juan Unified School District. And when I did, my daughter is actually doing a lot better in school. And so um, I asked some people, cause I work with, um, I do theater and arts. And so I work with a youth performing arts, which is predominantly African-Americans. And they tell me, oh, you gotta drive about 20, 30 minutes out. And they're right. At first, I was like, oh, there got to be something, you know. So I did my research. I looked. I talked to multiple people at Real Rogers. Bridges is full right now. Bridges is full right now. I said, my daughter needs something because she's hyper. She's she's going to get into something. You know, we work. We don't get off the four or five. She's going to get into something. I need to find something. Anybody can help me. I've emailed. I called. I called. The most I can find is something 30 minutes out. At the time, I was pregnant, just had a baby. It's just very hard when you move your family, I work for the government. So a lot of times we may move to different places for a couple of years, two or three years. I couldn't find anything. So we are moving back home. Um, I've asked, uh, she had dealings with going through anxiety and going through the move. So I was hoping I can get some type of connection until I moved her to SAC High. I got that connection. They developed her IEP plan. They developed this. When she was here, it's more so your daughter suspended this, this, that. When she went to Sylvan Middle, there were two people that took the time to engage with her, really helped with me. There was one guy named Doc, which I really appreciate everything he did. He said, no, she's getting in the bridges. She's getting to this. She's bright. I'm working with her. She, he, he, he put her in there, you know, but it took. I hate to cut you off, oh, but public comments only two minutes. But okay, I want sorry. to invite you to, I'm sure staff can follow up with you and also invite you to email the board so it could be a longer dialogue. Okay, I appreciate thank you so your public much. comment. Okay, thank you. And with that, thank you for your report, Mr. Cavello and team.
We are at item I2, Innovation School Program Update, Ms. Townsend Snyder. Got my whole team with me tonight. It's good to see you all again. Thank you for having us here. Um, good evening, President Creason, members of the board, Superintendent Bassanelli and Ms. Cunningham. Tonight, we are here to share with you our exciting journey on the planning, the selection, and implementation process of the Innovative School Program. Presenting with me this evening is Barry Roth, President of the San Juan Teachers Association, and Nina Mancina, our design consultant, who's also a San Juan retiree, community member, and parent of San Juan students. Also here with, with me this evening is Susie Landite, our lead administrator for the design team, Damon Smith, and Beth Wall, our SJPEC design team representatives, and a number of our design team members who are the most creative, amazing group of practitioners and are making this work come to life right in front of us with the wonderful staff and community member teams. The purpose of this presentation this evening is to present you with a high level overview of a year's worth of work while also giving you the details of these beginning chapters and a look at what's ahead. This will be one of probably quite a few updates that you'll receive from us along the way that we will present to you as we progress through the process. What's very important to us is that we hear your ideas, your thoughts, your wonderings, and everything that you're thinking about this process along the way. The innovative program is a design idea meant to be built with our community, with our families, with our community partners, with staff and with students as well. The innovative school program is unique in that we did not start with our own idea or a directive of what we wanted to implement at the school site. We started by asking the community and about and asking staff about what was needed. We didn't show up with solutions to their needs. We are designing prototypes based on what they tell us their strengths are, their opportunities are, their aspirations and results that they hope to reach as an outcome through the implementation of the design process. Later in this presentation, Nina will take you through des the design process and how she engages community and staff input, timelines that we are advancing through to reach our launch in the 24-25 school year. Up to this point, our focus and decision-making has been around the learning about design thinking, about planning for holding community meetings and determining which one of our nine elementary or K-8 schools in Citrus Heights would house the innovative school program. So without further ado, I would like to publicly congratulate. I feel like we need a long drum roll for that one. <laughs> Woodside K-8 School for being the selected site and a huge thank you to the site team, to the Woodside community, um, to the staff team because they've already begun to engage with the design team. <clears throat> During the community input sessions, the most frequently asked questions were, what does, the innovate, what does innovation mean? What does the innovative school look like? Will there be facilities upgrades? And then you heard those more systemic questions that sounded like, what is the plan? What's the focus? What are the data points that you'll collect? What are the metrics for success that you will see along the way? During this presentation, you will hear, hear answers to some of those questions. And for others, the answers is still, in some ways, it depends on the design. And to that answer, we want to call out that one of the largest parts of the design process is quite a bit of ambiguity along the way. When we say innovative, what we mean is a program at a school that will be designed for the students that are in front of us today, and a program that will evolve based on the students' needs over time. As for what the innovative school will look like, the answer is that still depends. We're right in the middle of the design process. And that's because we are designing based on what the shared needs at Woodside are based on what their staff and community tells us. Nina will share specifics about the direction and larger containers that the Woodside staff and community have now since they've been identified as needed areas in addition to the process that they've taken along the way to get there. 
We know that you all know well what the definition of ambiguity is. We placed this slide here so that we could call out um, that you might even experience some of the same feelings that we did along the way, including the design team, the Woodside team, and even the leadership team. And really that's this feeling of wanting to to have those concrete solutions, answers, resolution to certain questions along the way. And we understand, and all we ask is for your grace that when the answer tonight is still, it depends, it's because we're planning. And we also want to assure you that the concrete answers to those questions will absolutely come. One of the concrete answers as of today, again, is the work to this point, which is the program location at Woodside. The design team is working on designing the prototype through the 23-24 school year, and our launch of the program will begin in the 24-25 school year. Coming out of COVID, we knew there would soon be an opportunity to come back together to rebuild and generate something that would be helpful and valuable for our students and our community. So staff began having a conversation about building an innovative program to address the gaps that we all saw. Later in this presentation, you will see a timeline of that progress from beginning till our end point and where we are right now at this point in time. Our purpose for the innovative school is to serve the needs of students in real time based on the needs they bring to school today, which includes their academic and social emotional support. The data that we will be looking at is very similar to the data that you've seen in previous data presentations, such as iReady, Sabres, culture and climate data, attendance and enrollment data. We will use these as markers, not only for our progress, but for our design as we move forward. We want the school to be a community hub where relationships grow, where community members can meet one another, meet together and see each other through common interests and needs, a place where generations of families can gather and support students in their growth as a part of the community. We do recognize that the city of Citrus Heights has an interest in the same concept. And we do believe that we will be able to build strong relationships with our community and with our city as a result. We've already had one small indicator of success show up in the community realm of this work. One of the Woodside leadership team members reported to us just recently that a family shared with her that they were choosing to leave Woodside. But instead, because of the innovative school program, they, they decided they wanted to stay at Woodside because they could see that the innovative program just might bring something that was good for their students and their kids along the way. And finally, the design of the school. We really wanted this program to be co-created with the community, with our labor partners, which in itself is very unique and innovative. The innovative school will be built through a lens of equity where everyone is welcome, everyone has a place to grow, and everyone has a place to learn. I'd like to invite, invite Barry Roth to the podium to share with you just a little bit about the team's involvement in the design process. Thank you, Amberly. As you'll see on this visual are the three teams that are working on this project. The three teams are working together to build the innovative school program, the community and school team, the design team, and the innovative leadership team. The school site and community's role is to provide us with the opportunity to come in, gather input and feedback, to share with us their needs, and let us know when we are getting closer to getting it right during the prototype process. The school site team, with the support from the innovative school leadership team, will then be responsible for the implementation of the program once it is designed. The role of the design team is to lead continuous conversations with community members and staff to gather input and feedback. The team meets regularly to analyze the information they have gathered and then use the information to design prototypes that reflect what they have learned. The process is a continuous cycle of gathering input and feedback, analyzing the information, and creating the next iteration of the prototype. The design team has had multiple opportunities to meet with Woodside, including this last Saturday, when they shared prototypes with the community and staff at Woodside's Spring Carnival. The Innovative Schools leadership team is a cross-section of labor groups and senior staff whose primary goal is to provide input and direction to the design team while not hindering 
their creativity for developing the design of the school. The leadership team meets a minimum of once every other week, but it's not unusual for us to meet multiple times within a week to, uh, to calibrate and plan for items such as school site decisions, timelines, negotiations, side letters of agreements, interviews, staff support, fiscal resources, school site support, to name a few. What you'll see on this next slide are those who are working together and in collaboration on the Innovative School Leadership Team. This team is yet another strong example of the high value we place on coming together in partnership to collaborate on problems of practice. This team will continue to support throughout the design process and then the implementation of the new design at Woodside. As I move to this next slide, I want to pause and I could ask the design team to stand and be recognized for their extremely amazing work that they've put in so far. While not all of them could be here today, they are tireless and always show up whenever they can. The first piece of creating the innovative school was to build a team that could lead the design process. Through a rigorous interview process, we sought to build a diverse team that brought views from a multitude of positions and schools across our district. We interviewed many teachers and landed on a team of brilliant practitioners who started on the design journey by learning about the design process at Stanford's D School. They also attended the Deeper Learning Conference at High Tech High to learn about designing, prototyping, and to network with other educators who are engaged in the innovative process or innovative approaches. Several book studies also increased their skill set, and the team has continued to hone their skills by grappling with various problems of practice. Once the design team had studied and practiced design thinking, they're ready to engage the Citrus Heights community, and they led the 18 community meetings with support from senior staff. They gathered information which would help determine where the innovative program would best be placed. I would now like to invite Nina to the podium to walk you through the community meetings, timelines, and design process. Good evening, members of the board. Thank you for this opportunity to come speak to you. It's been a while. Um, as mentioned, the design team conducted community meetings at all nine Citrus Heights Elementary and K-8 schools. Two meetings were scheduled at each school, one at the end of the school day to support attendance by staff and families picking students up after school, and one in the evening to reach working families and community members. This has been an effective strategy we have used in the past to maximize the number of people we connect with. In addition to the in-person meetings, we also created a shared Google form that allowed staff, families, and community unable to attend the meetings to provide input into the process. The community meetings provided us not only with information about hopes and needs, but it provided us with information that, as the starting point for the design process we're in currently engaged in. The number of participants varied at these meetings from large groups to small groups of both staff and community and at a few sites, some students. Additionally, we provided childcare and translation services at all of the meetings. Outreach was conducted using traditional modes of communication with the support of our communication team led by Trent Allen and also a few unique plugs from the Citrus Heights Media and City Council. Notifications of these meetings included school-wide newsletters to the school community, classroom invitations to families through newsletters and in-person conversations, school and district web page presence, social media presence, the Citrus Heights City Council shared with their membership and community, and the Citrus Heights media outlet, the Sentinel Articles. At each of the community meetings, we used the same protocol built around the SOAR model, which is a modified form of the traditional Scott analysis by the Center for Appreciative Inquiry. SOAR stands for Strengths, Opportunities, Aspirations, and Results. The goal of the model is to help participants appreciate the present and imagine the ideal as the basis for designing something that aligns those two. Each of the four areas allowed us to deepen our understanding of the school and identify what success would look like. This information will allow us to begin to build measurable outcomes as we move forward through design and implementation to determine if we are actually aligning the two. 
and what evidence we have to support them. So let's take a few minutes here to walk through the design process as represented in this graphic. At the center of this visual is noticing and reflecting. This is central to our work because it is important that we ask ourselves questions about whose voices we have not heard. How might we find other ways to explore our thinking with the full community? Who is most affected by the changes that we are proposing? And how might we better understand the complexity of this school and its com community in order to be responsive to their needs and our design? At the beginning of the diagram is empathize. The school identification process was the beginning of this work as was our attendance at staff meetings and the carnival. We will continue to conduct this part of the process as we move forward, always seeking out voices we have not heard from and ways to reach people. The next step in the process is to define the work. Here we examine the data gathered and, and created statements we call our point of view. This helps us in our design process and is a critical step in the work with the community. This step blends into the next step inquiry. It is particularly important at this step that we check for understanding and make sure what we thought we heard is accurate. We consistently ask the question, did we get it right? Imagining and prototyping are all connected as we use the data we have gathered and our point of view to generate ideas of using how might we questions. Examples of those are how might we amp up the good, how might we design for belonging, how might we take it to the extreme? And how might we create a spirit of innovation? The initial prototypes themselves are what we call low res. This serves two purposes. It gives staff and, and community something visual to respond to, and they are cheap. Research is very clear that interacting with information visually changes how we see and hear what is being shared. The low cost aspect frees us up to let go of things that are not working because we have not spent a lot of money on them. The final and really a new beginning of the cyclical process is the try or test phase. This is part of the constant check in around, did we get it right? But also provides an opportunity to iterate what we have created. A great example of this happened on Saturday at the carnival. One of the students was looking at one of the prototypes we had on display. A team member explained components of it to him. After he had walked away, he almost immediately came back and said, I have an idea about how we could make that better. It was brilliant. This is exactly what you want to have happen during the try phase. Another real-time example of this process was the school selection. After we finished with the 18 community meetings, the design team gathered to debrief all of what we had learned from these communities. Each school was represented by a large piece of butcher paper and sticky notes gathered at the community meeting were sorted to create a visual of what we had heard. We used this to develop a point of view for each of the schools that included who we met, what we, we were amazed to learn, what inferences or wonderings did we have based on the data, and what could we create that would be game changing for them. This data was then used to determine each school site's readiness for a new program. To assist us in this process, we created a simple rubric that determined their excitement around the idea of rebranding and reimagining, readiness for change and doing something unique and different with the community's input, level of engagement and dialogue around the future of their school and the strengths of the school's identity. This information was provided to the district leadership team to incorporate in their selection process. As for the point of view for Woodside, based on the data gathered, we identify the following design focus areas, strengthening academics and enrichment opportunities, modifications to the physical space to support academics, enrichment and belonging, and an identity and culture. At our next meeting with staff, we will be exploring these in depth and asking, did we get it right? This timeline provides an overview of the project from its inception to its launch in the 2024-25 school year. In between each of the marking points, there are multiple conversations, meetings, interviews, Zooms, and planning sessions. The star in the center shows where we are currently, and the bar along the bottom shows the ongoing work throughout the entire design process. At our next board presentation, we will provide you with an updated timeline with additional details. 
I will now invite Amber Lee back to the podium to share the highlights for the components of the selection process and our next steps. Thank you. Well, the selection of the school was definitely not easy. We learned so much from every single one of the schools. It was truly a joy to be in the Citrus Heights area, talking with the community members and the families. The themes we heard from all of them really just highlighted the community and sense of belonging that they really feel as an individual school group. So with that, as I said, the school selection was definitely not easy. Each school had those amazing qualities that all of us wanted to engage in. We wished we had nine different teams. We really do have um, something special in Citrus Heights. The indicators, as Nina said, um, that we used for determining the team were the designs team, the design team's recommendation for readiness, um, as Nina just shared with you. Community and staff input was a big piece. Considerations um, for community support, such as Citrus Heights, they are very supportive of what we're doing and we're very pleased to be partners with them. Consideration of school facilities and Frank's team helping us out on potential, potential facilities usage. And then finally, a review of enrollment and attendance data for each of the school sites. We want to send a sincere thank you to all the staff members and community because every single school did participate in these community meetings and we had members come out um, in bad weather and we were very thankful that they did. For our Citrus Heights schools that were not selected um, and there were a number of them that were really choose me, choose me, um, they too will have an opportunity to engage with the Innovative Schools design team to build some supports through areas of opportunity that were identified in the community meetings. As a note, staff and the design team did feel strongly that there was, an especial, there was a special opportunity to engage with the Arlington Heights team. Um, because of the work that they're doing and the work that they want to continue to do, we believe that we can support them too in advancing some of the existing work that they have going on. We've already reached out to the team and have started working with them as well. More to come on that. Okay, so for our next steps, um, we'll progress through this into the summer and into the 23-24 school year to ensure that we're fine tuning in a number of areas to include communication, um, continued communication with families, community members and staff by utilizing not only our known communication resources to continue to look for ways to broaden groups, but also to work with our city partners as we progress through the design and implementation. We very much appreciated the media support that they gave us, and I think that we can continue to build a relationship there to help us in our communication. We will continue to work um, with our comms team to ensure that we're promoting the innovative school to the community so that families are aware of the program prior to its opening so that they know what they're getting into if they decide to come to school with us at Woodside. Finally, the site staff and community will continue to be supported through in-person meetings. We have a very robust question and answer um, session that we do with them because of the ambiguity, and we will continue to do that for and with them. Principal selection. So the principal selection process started yesterday, and we hope to have you more information about the selection of the leader for that site by the end of this school week. More to come. For facilities, um, as the design for the innovative school continues, we will keep the facilities team and the leadership team together so that Frank and his team can look at the facilities at Woodside to guide us on the process and also put up some bumper guards because we're really good at dreaming. The program iteration and prototyping, the design team will continue to move through multiple prototypes with the staff and community so that we're able to implement at the beginning of the 24-25 school year. And finally, enrollment. This did come up in many of our community meetings. They wanted to know if we were going to do enrollment different at Woodside and make it something that stood out to be different from the rest of the district, and that is not the case. Enrollment at Woodside will not deviate from its current enrollment. Um, as a neighborhood schools, families may choose to open enroll into the program, just as they do at all of our other schools in San Juan. Um, we will work with the San Juan Central team to make sure that, again, that information is pushed out prior to the open enrollment window closing. 
So with that, we thank you. We recognize that this might pump just a little bit of ambiguity into your minds and wonder and thought, but we're here to answer your questions. We very much appreciate your support. And mostly we really want to hear your thoughts and questions along the way because it will only help us get better. So with that, I pass it back to you. President Creason, for any questions or comments. Thank you so much for the wonderful report. Any comments, questions from the board? Ms. Viesquez? A lot of back and forth here, and I just wanted to deliberately say first, thank you very much for the report. You're Second, um, I do have some questions and comments. I want to be deliberately... Um, pay a little bit of deference to my colleagues from Citrus Heights. And I just wanted to say that I would love to hear from you both before I share my words. So there was a lot of looking back and forth and I just wanted to say that's my plan. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Vies. Mr. Amy. My comments were just really simple as I really appreciate the community outreach process that you went through. Um, not only holding the meetings, but having a really structured discussion and allowing that feedback to guide the process and guide the school selection. Um, I'm I'm not deep enough into Citrus Heights to know kind of what the feeling was about that, but um, I think what I've heard from the community is they've long felt that that wasn't a process they were involved in. So I think that was probably pretty helpful. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. Ms. Krepchek. Thank you for the report. I enjoyed, um, well, I don't know what's better. Is that better? I don't know. It's good. Yeah. Thank you. I learned a lot. Um, I have a few questions and sorry, I just thought of them right now. So hopefully it's okay. It's all right. Um, the partnership with Citrus Heights, it was intentional that the innovative school be in Citrus Heights. Um, was there an opportunity for them to be part of the design team and are they? And if so, who is it and what does that look like? There is always a part, uh, an opportunity for them to be a part of the design team because while we have our design team that we have here with us, it's not limited to the design team. So meaning the process that we go through to collect feedback and input and the prototyping, absolutely they can participate. Are they on our formal design team though that's sitting in the room right now? No, they are not. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And then I was surprised to hear that Arlington is like a second pseudo innovative school. So I'd like, if you have anything to add to that at this time, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah. So Arlington Heights, what, what the design team discovered through our community processes, they're sort of pretty dialed in. They have a very strong identity. They know who they are and they know what they're trying to do. Obviously, uh, we just went through a pandemic, so that altered stuff. Their physical plant, because they're growing, has also changed, so it's limited some of their ability. They're a project lead the way school, which is a career tech pathway in engineering. Um, and so what we really recommended and, and uh, the leadership team agreed with is that we could do some, some really quick wins with them that would shore them up to really be able to go back and fully realize that project that they had in place prior to all sort of the craziness we've been through for the last few years. So it's not a full redesign as we're doing with the other schools because they don't need with the other school, they don't need that, but it is sort of a support. Thank you. And then um, you mentioned, Emberly, um, that there were some opportunities for the schools who were in the running, but that didn't get to be chosen, um, that there are some supports available for them some things can you talk about that yeah so nina you can layer into no, this okay in case i leave anything out <laughs> um all of what we gathered um the picture that we showed that had all of the ideas and wonders and hopes and dreams because every single school site was able to go through that process we want to loop back with them and share with them what we heard so that if there's something there they can engage in and choose to as a staff that we would support them most of those things are some some of the simpler ideas of communication, which isn't so simple, but things that the staff and community were asking for that they knew that they could bump up. Um, whereas Woodside, it's you know a big a big big project. To be honest, we could actually do this at all nine schools, <laughs> and would love to. Some of us advocated for that, but <laughs> I um, I will share that. 
I did hear a lot of feedback from the, the schools that didn't get selected and really wanted to be. And so as you were talking about Arlington, I visited, it's a stellar school. They've really, like you said, dialed in, they have a good thing going. And like many of the schools do, um, I'm just a little bit concerned about the equity of it because if Arlington, initially there was just one winner, you know, for lack of a better word, but now there's two. And so I'm not sure that ambiguity that we talked about earlier, it does provide a little bit more space for ambiguity for schools to say, well, why not us? Yeah. So just something to consider. Thank you. I Thanks. really appreciate that comment. Thank you. And I think I just want to layer in a little bit. So we had a lot of dialogue when it came time to identify the school that was going to be selected. And some of us did want nine. Um, <laughs> And there's a capacity issue. And so where we landed is in order to do this right for one school, we really needed to focus our efforts. There was a lot of data collection that's very formative in supporting the other schools as well. So even though it's not happening right now, it there are opportunities in the future, but right now we're really focusing our efforts on Woodside. Thank you. Any other questions, comments from the board? Mr. Hernandez. I, I just want to ask the the, enroll, the enrollment part of Woodside directly because uh, you know you said it's going to be the normal enrollment open enrollment, but yet if it's a K through eight, I assume we're going to have two kindergartens, two first grades, whatever, however the numbers may be. So my question is is what's the capacity there? Because I think it is going to draw attention to it. I do too. And as a result of that, I think the other part of what we're just mentioning is, you know, I think we sell the sizzle and, and that we say that Woodside is our pilot program, you know, and I think that it, cause it sounds like it is anyway. And, and then, you know, that I'm just thinking out loud there, but so my, I'm really commenting, you know, I really want to focus on the enrollment. Um, because I, I, I think we're going to be limited to, I think more people are going to want to be there than we have capacity for. So how are we going to handle capacity is my real question. Yeah, that's a great question. So currently their projected enrollment, I, I thought that might come, um, but because I mentioned it, the current projected enrollment is 406. Their capacity is well beyond 406. When you walk onto campus, there are empty rooms. Um, there are classrooms being used for different types of things that could be re repurposed. And Frank would help us identify some of those spaces. And then what happens at the site as a result of any kind of ads is dependent upon the property and what we're able to do fiscally. Right now, though, we have 288 TK5 kids that are there, and we have 100 projected to be there and 118 in 6-8. And when you talk to the staff team, um, they will tell you that they really want to grow those middle years. They feel like if the middle years grew, they could provide more opportunities, especially through electives, which as you all know, is dependent upon the number of kids that attend. Right. Um, so it would probably be the first thing that they talk to you about when you went out, if you asked them that question. Um, but they do want to grow their site. They do want it to get bigger. As far as capacity goes, it's just totally dependent upon the facilities and what our capacity is to maybe do something extra. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Viesquez. Some of the points kind of were already tangentially addressed. I have a couple of questions that I don't anticipate will be answered right now. I just want you to know that they're points of interest. Um, but one question that you might be able to answer is just on the community input, can you ballpark like how many participants in these variety, like in these various input settings um, there was like in aggregate? Yeah. I'd have to do math in my head right now. Um, <laughs> so, so they ranged, um, as we noted, noted from small to large. Our our date, our not daytime, but the earlier after school events were more. Uh, they were better attended, mm -hmm. um, and that usually it ranged between ten to one school. One or two had about fifty people attend at that. Um, the evening events, because I don't know if you recall, but there was a lot of rain mm -hmm. those couple of weeks. So those were a little tougher. Um, so some we would get like, you know, 10 people, but there were like our last event was right at the crazy part of the storm. And we had 
one person come and it was a Citrus Heights City Council member. So what we did is the design team, we had our SOAR protocol that we used in a world cafe where people would rotate around. So when we only had a small group, then the design team broke up and did individual interviews with those people. Somebody at one of the meetings asked me, are, are you bummed that like there's not a lot of people here? And I said, no, because there's people here. Right. And so I can have a different dialogue with people. So any of those things are always a positive opportunity. So yeah, I would have to do nine times 20, 30. I don't know what, what that math oh, is. Yeah. A, a, range is what I was, a range is what I was looking for. So I'll take it. I'll take it. But I'm not gonna not by Mr. Hill or <laughs> listen. I don't want to go over grades or anything, but <laughs> let's not go into that. Um and I don't wanna, you know, do any lack do anybody injustice by not being able to do math off the top of my head. That is helpful. I was just kind of looking for a range. So thank you. A more broader question that I have is just, and I think this is sort of down the road, is would love to kind of um, see this as an asterisk to our bigger facilities master plan. We do have, you know, a plan, et cetera, um, how that plays in. This is exciting and a new part of that. Um, I never envisioned that the facilities master plan was not going to be deviated from. And so just would love to see that woven in at some point, maybe not as a specific item, but whenever there's an opportunity for a future, future update on that. And then I'm curious for just a little bit of expansion. There was a, some discussion about how there was a lot of hope for different enrollment opportunities. Can you expand just a little bit on what that looks like? Was it like anything other than what we do now or was there a specific thing that the community had in mind oh, in terms okay. of an so alternative i think what you're referring to is this i what came up in each of the community meetings i hope this is what you're referring to and if it's not just stop me um each of as we talked to each of the school sites they were very worried that we were going to change the enrollment process and the students that attended school there currently would somehow or another not be able to. That's helpful. Um, their biggest, if you mention it, kind of like I mentioned enrollment with the, you know, if you talk to them about numbers, it would be in the middle years. Mm -hmm. If you talk to them about um, their concern for enrollment, it would have been that they would lose the kids that they currently had. And that was across all of, all nine of the schools in Citrus Heights. And that was amazing to hear because they are about their community of kids. It was really, really heartwarming. That's helpful. And yes, that did answer yeah. my question. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Costa. Thank you so much for the report. And we know that I'm not good with ambiguity. So I appreciated the details that we heard tonight and look forward to more details. One thing that occurred to me, if staff members once the plan is further developed and the new principle is in place. Will there be something, an opt out for staff members who might not want to participate? Yeah, that's a great question. Yes, there will be. So for this year going into um, this process, uh, folks at the site practitioners were able to opt out. Um, we were happy that none did at this point. Um, so they are that engaged. They want to uh, participate and to learn and see what can be created. Um, next year, there'll be an opt out too. by that time, the plan will the design plan um, will be much, you know, closer to finalize or really finalize for us and we'll be starting to think about implementation. So folks could opt out, they would um, then go to, through our um, surplusing process. Um, and so they do have that opportunity. So it just that's a we felt a, a fair way to approach that. Um, but we're really happy people want to engage with the design team. Yes. to go through this process to see what they can create for their students. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Very exciting. I hope that you will keep updating us, whether it's with board communications or board reports like this one. I'm excited to see as you progress the direction that the process takes. So thank you very much. Thank you to all the design team. Ms. Kretchett? One more question. Um, in your flower, you talked about the inquiry and asking the questions, and it just occurred to me, um, do you already have formalized the, I don't know, as part of your trial process, the questions that you will ask afterwards of what's, you know, what are some kind of metrics of how, what are you going to measure? What will determine success? What is the definition of success? This is a new concept. So what does success look like and how do we measure it? 
Yeah, I'll layer so it as I noted, the, the SOAR model that we use, the, the fourth piece is results. Mm -hmm. So we've already begin, begun to gather that information from the community and we'll continue to ask that question. And what we do, right, we don't expect them to be able to say, uh, you know, a 3% decrease in, you know, uh, referrals to for suspension or whatever. You know, we don't expect them to get to that level. But what we want to hear is that that how their kids will feel or how they feel in the environment. So that's the stuff they've already shared with us. That then we can work with our accountability department here and staff to create some metrics that actually measure that as we begin to implement. So how engaged people are, if students are coming to school, those kind of things. So I think they've already, you know, all the things that we as parents care about, that's what we've heard, that my kid's happy, that my kid's learning, all those kind of things. So we'll put actual metrics to that, those feelings, I guess. And then if I could just layer in a tiny bit more um, regarding attendance and enrollment, we would expect to see attendance improve. We would expect to see enrollment increase. Um, as far as the academic component goes, and, and if we're looking at iReady data and even social emotional, like the Sabres data we talked about in the ELO presentation, um, we would expect to see those things improve too as culture and climate improves, though we may not see as immediate an improvement because of the timeline it takes, right? The three-year implementation component is a real thing, um, but we would expect to see some immediate actions and items that showed up that would tell us, yes, we're getting it right, or no, we're not. Our hope is for the first. And let me add one other thing, because in my past experience, when we work with communities, a lot of times we look at metrics that the community doesn't understand. And, and so we have to figure out a way also that we translate that so that they actually see, okay, here's what you said, here's what we sort of designed in response to that, and then here's the benefits we're seeing. So that we have a different kind of dialogue with people about the data that we're used to having conversations about. Any other comments, questions from the board? Well, thank you for that lovely report. I'm really excited for the implementation journey. And thank you to the team. I know it's a whole lot of extra. Yeah. And it's not like you don't have a lot to do already. They're so amazing. say it again. They're amazing. Or pardon me. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, Sorry, the sun's going down, so it gets kind of weird. Um, <laughs> oh, Superintendent Bessonelli. I also just want to share my appreciation for the for the hours and hours and hours of work that the team has put in on slide 11 with the timeline. Um, it gives you touch points around dates. What it doesn't tell you is the volume of hours that the team has worked to engage with the community as well as in their own professional learning um, and just their team time together. And so I, it is not lost on me and all of us on that work. And so I wanna say thank you very, very much um, for what you're doing for our, our district, for our school. Some of the low res prototypes are in my office if you want to walk by yeah, and look. Yeah, there's, there's a low res that was created by the team, and then I think a couple that were. Are you created speaking by to the, the mic team. just for our YouTube friends? Into the mic. Oh, sorry. There's a low res that was created by the team um, about the outside space at Woodside, and then there's a, one, two or three that were created by students at the carnival. That's fun. That's fun. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Appreciate appreciate the report. We are at item I-3, Special Education Commun Community Advisory Committee Bylaws. Mr. Allen. Good evening, President Creason, of the board and Superintendent Bassanelli. I am back with another set of bylaws for you to consider tonight. Uh, these are for our Special Education Community Advisory Committee. Uh, and I will let you know that we actually started working on these prior to our last couple of sets of bylaws mm -hmm. um, and took a moment of pause so we could get those other ones done. I will say I've had a great time actually working on this set of bylaws. I've kind of embedded with the CAC for the last few months and got to have some great conversations with them. So I've had a lot of feedback on these. And I'll share some of that with you tonight. Um, some positive, some concerns, as change usually brings. Um, so um, I think overall a positive move uh, in the right direction for folks. But let me highlight just a couple of uh, changes that this brings to the committee. Um, and then happy to take any questions or comments that you may have. Um, first, I wanna let you know that really we are trying to certainly make sure that we realign purpose of the committee to really focus on what the education code calls out and what the special education local plan calls out, which is for this committee to focus on providing input on uh, 
updating and making modifications to that special education local plan. So just like we have our LCAP uh, special education, the SELPA has a local plan that helps govern and guide what they do. Um, and this committee specifically is really about collecting voice, provide input into that process of updating that document. So we really wanna make sure we have a process in place that allows them to do that. So one of the big changes that comes um, with this new set of bylaws for this committee is how those committee members would be selected. Right now, this committee selects its members by uh, if you attend two of their meetings, you are then eligible for membership. And you are then kind of reviewed by a membership committee. Um, and if that membership committee says, we'll put you forward, then that name comes forward to the board for ratification. Um, this would move it to a process very similar to what we've done with our other committees. Uh, so it would be by board appointment and similar to what we did with the LCAP PAC, it also provides the opportunity for the superintendent to appoint some positions to this committee, uh, which allows us to really kind of get into making sure we have some student members on this group um, and making sure that we kind of have a broad set of voice there as well. Um, so those would be the changes in as far as how those folks are selected. Um, does maintain the requirements for who is on this committee. So this committee can be um, open to not only parents, uh, but it is open to staff as well as students and any community member. Uh, really the focus is on those who have an interest or a connection to special education. Um, that is kind of the determination of who's making the appointment though. So certainly in those conversations you would have with potential appointees, you would be making that determination if that's somebody who you would want to appoint um, or if that's somebody who you would not want to appoint. Um, I will also highlight for you, um, we, um, as we always do, we look for um, anything that we need to modify for a specific committee. Um, and I will highlight for you that we have two specific officers included in these sets of bylaws. So our other sets that we just worked on have a chair and a vice chair. This group has those two positions, as well as a membership officer and an engagement officer. So part of this group's history and culture is really to kind of go out and engage the special education community to have voice with each other um, and really to kind of come together. So that's kind of where that engagement officer is really um, focused on. Um, we really wanna make sure that effort is around bringing voice to that special education local plan as we move forward. Um, but also then that membership officer, uh, because we do wanna make sure that this group has a voice in uh, how this committee kind of works and gets put together. We have that language in here. One of the concerns the committee asked us to take a look at, uh, they currently have language that says um, they have a kind of a direct role in that selection of committee members. Um, this doesn't have a direct role necessarily in choosing because it becomes your appointment. Um, but we, what we did do is include language in here that says that membership chair gets to, uh, that membership person gets to chair a subcommittee that will look at our selection process so they can give us some feedback on, we're not going broad enough, we're not soliciting enough uh, out into the community so they can give us some feedback on how we're getting folks onto the committee um, and making that a better process as we go through time. And then just a couple of notes on committee feedback that we've had, kind of two big buckets um, of kind of concerns that folks have really expressed. One, and this is probably the biggest one, is the impact to our existing members who are on the committee. We have some folks who've been on this committee for quite a while. Um, we have folks who are very passionate about serving on this group. Um, so just wanting to know, um, do they get to continue to serve? Is anybody gonna get kicked off? We have the same language in these bylaws as our other sets of bylaws that say existing members um, get to stay and finish their terms. They do not get kicked off because we adopt these bylaws. So what we would be doing, similar to our LCAP pack, we'd be taking the existing members, we would be um, quasi assigning them to board members as they finish their terms and then making a schedule for appointments as those positions open up. Um, and then the other area is just to really make sure that we have alignment with the local plan itself. So we're taking a look at that language just to make sure there's no conflicts or other pieces there. Um, so far that's looking very good and I don't think we're gonna have any issues with that as well. And with that, I will pause and take any questions or comments you may have. Thank you for all of your work on this. Any comments, questions from the board? Mr. Avey. I'll just say, you know, I love bylaws. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, 
I think this reflects a lot of the work that you have made in other bylaws, so I think it does align everything very well. Um, by happenstance, I'm actually going to be at the CAC tomorrow night um, when they are. I saw this was on the agenda for their discussion, so I look forward to that. But um, I think overall, they seem like good, good positive changes, kind of aligning things. Um, I think maybe a part of the membership officer, um, maybe a valid role would be helping to recruit uh, new members so that they can play a role. I know as a board member, I would appreciate input on, you know, people that may be seeking an appointment to this committee and they may have, um, be a part of a community I'm not a part of and be able to help recruit for that. So that may be an additional role for either the membership officer or the engagement officer. Ms. Costa. I've encountered an unusual problem with appointing to other committees, and I see it as potentially being a big problem with our special education, with CAC. Um, and what's happening is I have parents contact me who are interested in being in my, being appointed by me, um, because the school is in my trustee area. But then when I ask Stephanie to check, Mrs. Cunningham to check on the address, they live in another trustees area, so I can't appoint them. And with special education students who don't, who are actually transferring to other areas of the district for their programs, I think that's going to be an added problem for CAC. But I'm finding it a problem for all of the appoint, appointed committees. I keep sending them on to my colleagues, but it's not helping me to make appointments. So um, I hope we can come back and discuss that because it it has it's troublesome. Mr. Hernandez. Did I read that wrong, Ms. Costa, that you are able to appoint someone that's not in your area? One one in and one out? One in and one out. Wait. Yes, one in and one out. But if the second one happens to have a child in a school in my trustee area, they assume they're in because their child's in that school, not because of their home address. So that puts them as the out. out. Any other comments, questions from the board? Well, thank you. I know how much work you've put into this, and I know how passionate the CAC has been. I've been lucky to be the board liaison for quite some time now. And the one thing I want to raise is I believe that this committee, it's a community of folks that have very similar lived experience. It's more than just um, what's in the ed code. So I am very appreciative that we're getting aligned with what we need the committee to do in an advisory role to this board, 100%. Something I'm wondering about is how we can support the special education community as a whole, which I think we're already starting to do some of this, to get what they were looking for and what they have been getting out of this committee that we're kind of shifting away from, um, that that the camaraderie, the just the networking, the support um, of it all. And I know that we're having um, new opportunities that Dr. Calvin and uh, Ms. Adolfson have brought forward. I know there's meet and greets with the staff now. There's a lot of that, you know, lots of new thinking and a lot of um, great work going into that, but just something I want to uplift and just acknowledge. I know that this group gets a lot from each other. Um, and maybe um, the committee business, the committees where the business needs to take place. And I'm fully in support of that, but also want to just make sure that we're doing what we can to support the other needs um, for the community. I, I appreciate that. That's one thing I've certainly picked up on spending time with this group. Um, and I applaud the department um, and their leadership on putting those events together before the meetings. I think that really is addressing that need to build that community as well. Um, I think the reflection of the engagement person, just like when we have our LCAP process, a big part of that is going out and collecting voice to inform that. Um, you can do that in lots of different ways. I think that's where this group is being a little creative and saying we can still go out and do some of those things because so much of that helps us build voice and helps us build connections to collect voice. Yeah. So it doesn't say you can't engage in that work. Um, we just want to focus make sure we're collecting that voice to inform this process while we're doing that work as well. So I, I don't think it's an either or, I think you can do both. And I think this group um, is well suited to be able to do that. Sounds good. This item will come back for action on June 13th. Thank you, Mr. Allen.
We are at item I-4, the district's initial proposal with CSEA. Mr. Oropalo. Thank you, President Creason, board member, Superintendent Besson, like Ms. Cunningham. I'm here tonight to present the superintendent's recommendation that the district adopt bargaining interest with the California School Employees Association Chapter 127 for 23-24 openers. Uh, this is was presented to the board on for discussion on May 9th, and this is an action item, and I can answer any questions if you have them. Thank you so much. We do not have any public comments on this item. Do any board members have questions or comments? See, not, none. This is an action item. Is there a motion to adopt the district's bar bargaining interest with the California School Employees Association Chapter 127 for 2023-2024? Move the item. Moved by Mr. Hernandez. Is there a second? Second by Ms. Viesquez. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That was unanimous. We are at item I-5, the district's initial proposal with SJSA. Mr. Oropalo. Thank you, President Creason. I'm here tonight to present the superintendent's recommendation that the district adopt the bargaining interest with the San Juan Supervisors Association for 23-24 openers. Again, this was presented on May 9th, and this is an action item. Thank you. We do not have any public comments on this item. Do any board members have any questions or comments? Seeing none, this is an action item. Is there a motion to adopt the district's bargaining interest with the San Juan Supervisors Association for 2023-2024? So moved. Moved by Ms. Krevchek. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Avey. All those in favor say aye. 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 That was unanimous. We are at item I-6, the district's initial proposal with SJ Peck. Mr. Oropalo. Thank you, President Creason. Again, I'm here to uh, present the superintendent's recommendation to adopt the district's bargain interest with the San Juan Professional Education Coalition for 23-24. Again, this was presented May uh, 9th, and this is an action item. Thank you. We do not have any public comments. Do any board members have comments or questions? Seeing none, this is an action item. Is there a motion to adopt the district's bargaining interest with the San Juan Professional Educators Coalition for 2023-2024? Moved by Ms. Viesquez, seconded by Mr. Hernandez. All those in favor say aye. 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 That was unanimous. We are at item I-7, amended cabinet contracts. Mr. Oropolo. Thank you, President Creason. I'm here tonight to present the superintendent's recommendation that the governing board approve amended employment contracts for cabinet members. Pursuant to language in the contracts, cabinet contracts will be amended annually when the cabinet member has received a positive evaluation, resulting in an additional year on their contract. Each cabinet member received a positive evaluation for 22-23 school year. And this is a action item, and I'm pleased to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Do board members have any questions, Mr. Avey? Uh, just one question. Um, for clarification, the contract amendments, these are amending the contract that was originally adopted by the board uh, when the person originally assumed their position. That is correct. So this isn't the entirety of their contract. This is simply an amendment to the contract on file. That is correct. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? This is an action item. Is there a motion to approve the amended contracts for cabinet members? So moved. Moved by Ms. Costa. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Viesquez. All those in favor say aye. 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 That was unanimous. <clears throat> we are at item I-8, general counsel contract. Mr. Arapolo. Good evening, President Creason, board member, Superintendent Bessonelli, Ms. Cunningham. I'm pleased to bring this item to your attention. I'm here tonight to present the superintendent's recommendation that the governing board approve the general counsel contract for Phoenicia Clark Gaddis. And pursuant to current legislation, the general uh, counsel contract for Ms. Gaddis is for two years. Ms. Gaddis' salary will be identified on the cabinet uh, salary schedule for 22-3-24 school year and will receive any and all benefits that are received by the district administrators. I am also pleased to see Ms. Gaddis in attendance tonight, so welcome. And I'm here to answer any questions. This is an action item, and I can answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Mr. Oropolo. Any comments or questions from the board? Ms. Viesquez. Just actually say welcome to the team, or maybe after we vote. But um, <laughs> good to see you. Thanks for joining us, and excited to work with you. And I'd ha be happy to make a motion when it's appropriate. Any other comments or questions from the team? Or from the? Yeah, we're on a team. Second. Okay. <laughs> from the board is what I meant to say. This is an action item, so just for the official record, is there a motion to approve the employment contract for general counsel, Phoenicia Clark Gaddis, 
so moved. moved by Ms. I'm just reading out the item. And yes, Ms. Viesquez moved. It was seconded by Ms. Costa. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That was unanimous. Welcome. Welcome to the team, and I look forward to getting to know you. And I know that you have a new addition. So now we have two cabinet members with two new little babies. Yeah. You're the legal counsel, so if you're allowed to do it, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to thank you, members of the board, uh, Superintendent Bassinelli. I did interview after having my baby a, a week before, so I truly thank you guys for your patience. Um, through that process and he was going to be here but nine o'clock is definitely past his bedtime <laughs> um but thank you guys i look forward to this thank you thank you thank you welcome awesome awesome we are at we are at item j board reports are there any board reports Ms. costa I would just like to recognize and honor ABC News 10 Teacher of the Year, Jessica Campos. Mm -hmm. Jessica is a teacher of visually impaired and blind students at 19 elementary schools. Uh, she was honored by ABC News 10 at a ceremony at the IMAX Theater. Um, I actually did not know a lot of the details until I got there and didn't this has been going on for 20 years, and I really learned so much that night. Um, Schools Financial Credit Union, the IMAX, ABC News 10, and California State University Sacramento School of Education have all worked collaboratively for the last 20 years on this project. And California State University's School of Education actually vets all of the candidates and makes the selection for the Teacher of the Year. And on this particular night, they after they did this ceremony, they did a screening of Guardians of the Galaxy for all of the people in the audience, although I did not stay. Um, but Jessica's name was announced by Chris Pratt, the star of Guardians of the Galaxy, and the director, James Gunn, in a fee live feed from Los Angeles. So... They did a drum roll and then they came on the screen and announced her name and she was then taken to the front of the room and was met with great applause. So I was really very touched by the ceremony and hope to, I'm going to send a letter to Channel 10 and say, please invite all board members from school districts where you have um, a candidate for this honor because I think every one of you would have really enjoyed the ceremony and it was really a very positive event. Thank you. Thank you. Any other? Mr. Avey. Okay. Um, I'm pleased to share that uh, Assembly Member Josh Hoover and I will be hosting a community meeting at Bella Vista High School on June 22nd from 6 to 7 p.m. Uh, so all are welcome, June 22nd from 6 to 7 p.m. Thank you, Mr. Avey. Mr. Hernandez. I had the opportunity to go to a couple uh, events this past week with a couple of my colleagues. And uh, one was the CSEA uh, annual dinner recognition to their members. And that was always, that's always fun. And the second was uh, the, uh, our Indian American Indian graduation students throughout our various high schools. We had about 20, 25 Indian uh, student graduates from various tribes. And it was very, it was a great event as it always is. And, uh, and, uh, and I, I'm sure my colleagues that were there with me were honored to be there. Any other, Ms. Krevchuk? I got to attend um, the, our, MVP uh, partners, uh, what was that called? The, our most valuable partners celebration. And it really celebrated all of the, maybe not all, but I think most of the community partners 
um, were there. And I got to meet a lot of people and really see how they contribute to San Juan. And it was just like my site visits. It was very gratifying. It really filled my bucket to see that collaborative relationship because as they were doing something positive uh, for us, you know, their buckets were being filled. So it was just such a lovely event and really eye-opening for all the different programs that were happening. And I don't know if I would have known about them. We have like a skateboarding event that happens or a partner, which is incredibly cool. And I just, I think that um, somehow I missed it as a parent. I missed it. And I think that we should be bragging about these things more often because it's, it's fun and kids really enjoy it. And it keeps, um, a lot of times they'll, they'll do it on Fridays and Mondays and really get the kids to come to school on those, you know, beginning and end of the day uh, weeks. Um, so I just encourage us to brag about it and I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. And I'll keep my remarks very brief. Um, we have a baby thick pit in the world. Yay. So Daniel and Kim had their little baby, Juniper Rose. Um, it was Wednesday, right? And so I've seen some pictures, adorable little babies. So now we have two little tiny new babies on cabinet and I'm thrilled. And then you throw in a board member baby. Yeah. Win. So, <laughs> so congratulations. Uh, congratulations to the growing family. We are on item K, future agenda. Do any board members wish to add any agenda items to a future, any items to a future agenda? I see some green lights, but doesn't mean anything, right? Oh, Ms. No, Costa, Amy, okay. I'm sorry? I have something. You do, I'm sorry, Mr. Amy. Um, so when I was planning for the June 22nd community meeting, I think I found a glitch in our system, which is the district does not have a process for board members to host a community meeting in a district facility after hours. So for the June 22nd meeting, I had to register myself as an organization, the Ben AB organization and submit my homeowner's insurance as insurance validation to host a community meeting at Bella Vista. Um, staff was wonderful, they worked with me on it, but I think it was maybe a, a glitch in our system that we may wanna correct because I assume board members would like to be able to host community meetings at schools in our official capacity. So um, I would just recommend that maybe that's a future agenda item that we can either get clarity on the matter um, or look at any policies or procedures that we may need to address. I'm finishing a note. Thank you, Mr. Avey. Any others? All right. We do need to return to closed session to continue item B3 regarding the superintendent's evaluation. So thank you for attending and have a great night. I call the meeting of the San Juan Unified School District back to order. There are no closed session actions to report, so we are adjourned. <laughs>